Hello there. Welcome to the tea caddy. Come on in, why don't you? Eagle-eyed regulars will have observed that I find myself in somewhat straitened circumstances. More on that later. In the meantime, it's business as usual. Feel free to grab yourself a cuppa and have a rummage in the biscuit barrel before we get down to it. There's no rush. I'm not going anywhere. Here at the tea caddy, we always strive to be a friend to the environment by keeping our cuppas carbon neutral. So I was interested to read the other day in the Times of India about a new initiative to completely banish disposable plastic beverage cups from the country's vast rail network. The plan is to go back to serving tea in traditional clay coolhads, unglazed earthenware vessels made at local family potteries, similar in form to this Halloween lantern from the Museum of Welsh Life at St Fagans, but slightly smaller and without the holes. At first glance, this seemed like a marvellous idea, eliminating a major source of toxic waste and providing employment for millions of independent craftspeople at a stroke. But as I read further into the story, I became concerned. Like the plastic cups they will replace, the cool heads are intended as single-use vessels, but they are 40 times heavier and bulkier. The regular waste bins on larger station platforms will need to be replaced with reinforced 15-tonne capacity skips emptied twice a day. This year, passenger numbers on India's trains are predicted to return to pre-Covid levels of around 23 million journeys per day. If only one-fifth of those travellers buy a cuppa to enjoy along the way, this will mean that in order to provide sufficient clay for all those coolheads, an area the size of Nepal will need to be dug up every three and a half months. And this is not the only source of concern. Extra fuel will be needed to increase output, and it's feared that many of the small potteries set to get a boost from this grand plan will be keeping their makeshift kilns hot by burning plastic and chemical waste. On balance, I think there's probably a better way. In this edition of Sips and Tips, I shall be subjecting one of Britain's best-known high street brands to the rigours of the tea caddy test bench, and I'll be using applied physics to improve the performance efficiency of my kitchen waste containment device. But first, let's talk about chocolate and peanut butter. The US confectionery company, Reese's, or more correctly its owner, Hershey, has built a global brand out of combining these two foodstuffs. I've always felt that, rather like Kentucky Fried Chicken, the iconic Reese's Peanut Butter Cup promises more than it delivers. The problem lies with the quality of the ingredients. The outer cup severely tests the limits of what can legally be called chocolate, and the peanut butter cream, spelt C-R-E-M-E, -E, contained within, is almost certainly made from the same grade of nut that I buy in bulk to fill my bird feeder. I'm clearly not alone in these feelings. The World Wide Web is awash with homemade efforts, displaying a wide range of competences, or the lack thereof. It all looks like rather a lot of effort for not much return, so I've taken a slightly different tack. My personal journey to peanut butter cup heaven begins with a trip to Marks and Spencer. There is no cookery involved, as these tasty treats are assembled rather than made. It's a simple process that even the most ham-fisted oaf could easily master, and it all starts with a tube of M&S Swiss chocolate discs. When I first showed these to Hugh, he was outraged. The fact that the discs were scooped out on one side struck him as a blatant rip-off. I haven't seen him that angry about confectionery since the Toblerone debacle, but as is so often the case, where Hugh saw a problem, I saw an opportunity. If you want to stay close to the spirit of the Reese's original, an imported American smooth peanut butter is advised. If, on the other hand, you fancy trying something a bit more left-field, why not go for an alternative nut? Make sure to choose one that yields a reasonably firm paste, or you'll end up with nut butter all down your chin. My favourite 
is the M&S Crunchy with added pecans and maple syrup. It's so bloody good that, frankly, I could just spoon it right out of the jar. And indeed, I often do. If that's not nutty enough for you, how about maxing it out with a nut garnish? For this, I recommend the M&S Oven Roasted Nut Selection. They are less oily and salty than the standard variety, adding a nice bit of texture to the bite. The result is an attractive amuse-bouche that's perfect for delighting guests at your next soiree. And that's not all. M&S also makes a dark chocolate version of the disc. Peanut butter with dark chocolate is not really my bag, but I'll tell you what is. M&S Sicilian Lemon Curd. I know some people who are a little bit put off by the C word, but don't be. It's just lemon juice blended with sugar, butter and eggs. As with the nutty version, a carefully chosen garnish brings the confection to life. Candied peel is an excellent choice, but for a really electrifying treat, it's difficult to beat a nugget of crystallized ginger. In truth, there's a whole world of flavor combinations to be explored, but these examples that I've shown you today are my favorites, and there's no point in letting them go to waste. You won't be surprised to hear me say that they make a very fine accompaniment to a cup of tea. You'll want something with a bit of substance to it, like a flavoursome TGFOP Second Flush Assam, available in 100 gram pouches from Wittard of Chelsea. It helps to scour the nut butter out of those oral nooks and crannies, cleaning the palate in preparation for the next mouthful of delight. Ah, the heat of the ginger, the sharpness of the lemon, the bitterness of the chocolate. It's a flavor combination that really gets my taste buds dancing. Let's look again. As some of you may have already gathered, I'm self-isolating. This rather spartan little lean-to has been my bedroom, bathroom and living space since the current lockdown came into force. It's now the week between Christmas and New Year, with another four days to go before I can be reunited with my young friend Hugh. The festive season wasn't supposed to be like this, but I've only myself to blame. Just before the lockdown, I paid a brief visit to see my mother in the home counties. It's about a three-hour drive each way, and I can usually manage it non-stop. But for whatever reason, my bladder rebelled against me on the return journey, and I was forced to make an emergency layover at Lee Delamere. It was just a quick in and out with no extras, but the experience was quite unnerving, and it felt to me that the risk of getting infected with Covid in those moistly reeking service station latrines was at least as high as the chance of catching a dose of the clap in a Victorian brothel. I never would have forgiven myself if Hugh had come to harm as a result of my lack of bladder control. He has not always been the most conscientious custodian of his own well-being, and although he's clean now, his health is still quite fragile, so better safe than sorry, I say. Hopefully, by the time you're watching this, the ordeal will be over, and we will be sharing the sofa again and binging Shit's Creek together, instead of exchanging sad little messages in the Netflix teleparty chat feed. PG Tips, along with Typhoo and Tetley, is one of Britain's signature high street tea brands, and also one of its best-selling, although lately it has been facing stiff competition on the one side from more nimble competitors like Yorkshire Tea and Twinings, and on the other from trendy infusions that call themselves tea, but are in truth nothing of the kind. The brand's owner, Unilever, has been trying to stop the rot by expanding and enhancing the PG range, uh, with mixed results. I shall be comparing three varieties. The long-established standard blend, the ostensibly more refined gold blend, and at the other end of the scale, the Nescafe baiting instant granules. I would normally be doing this in my fully equipped, hermetically sealed testing suite, so the results of my ad hoc outdoor test may not be quite as nuanced as usual. But frankly, 
It's not as if I'm comparing a high-grown Da Hong Pao with a first flush Jin Jun Mei. It's just your common or garden supermarket tea. It's always instructive to take a look inside the bag, or the jar in the case of the granules. Even from a distance, it's evident that the gold has a slightly coarser texture than the standard blend. It'll be interesting to see how they bear up under closer scrutiny. The contents are carefully spread with a woodworker's shave hook, then viewed at 5x magnification under ultraviolet light. The gold blend leaf fragments are of a good size and reassuringly uniform. The standard blend tells a very different story, as you can plainly see, while the granules really need no further comment. For the purposes of this comparison, I'm preparing all three test subjects in the pot, even though this step is entirely redundant in the case of the instant granules. It is important to ensure that all the samples are at a similar temperature when they undergo the taste test, as a difference of more than 2.7 degrees completely invalidates any comparative observations. First out of the traps is the standard blend. I've drunk it many times, but here I'm just discovering how intolerably bland it is. This is a cupper that doesn't need you to like it. It just doesn't want you to hate it. Small wonder that Unilever have been losing market share in the fiercely contested hot beverage sector. The gold is appreciably different, as it should be, according to the guff on the side of the box. There's not a great deal of personality to the taste, but it does have a surprisingly bitter kick that might impress those at the shallow end of the tea-drinking demographic. It would make a tolerable accompaniment to a breakfast bap. I wasn't expecting great things from the instant tea, but neither was I expecting a PTSD-inducing gustatory nightmare. Viewers with sensitive dispositions should look away now. Was rather bracing. I think I shall be using the remaining contents of this jar as slug pellets. I'm sure they'll prove most effective. Before I wrap up, there's just time to include a quick tip that I recorded before putting myself into isolation. It deals with the all too familiar problem of impeded reverse atmospheric displacement caused by overstuffed bin bags. Take a look. We've all been there packed so much into the bin that it can't be shoved down any further. And finally, we have to take the bag out, except that it's wedged tight, and this happens. Problem is, the air can't get in as the bag is coming out, but there's a simple way to fix that. All you need is a bit of trunking, the sort of thing that people used to hide their speaker cables in before there was Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. With the trunking in place, the bag slips out like a wet kipper every time, Simply affix a couple of strips to the inside of your bin and bobs your uncle. You'll be enjoying more of this and less of this, which is better for your sense of self-worth as well as your kitchen floor. That's everything for now. So until we meet again, stay safe, stay cozy, and always remember to warm the pot. <laughs>